Hey, hey everyone. Welcome. My name is Mia Park, and this is my interview series called In Response, Interviews with Intriguing Internalizers. Uh, an internalizer is a person who, in this lovely series that I know, um, who I think is very special, smart, insightful, sees the world, processes the world in interesting ways. And I'm interviewing friends and family that I actually have a connection with from all over the world, um, from scientists to pastors, from painters to school teachers. So there's a lot of range of interesting people that I'm talking to, including our guest here, Eric Beiler. <laughs> so Eric and I met, we actually met at, uh, my friend Robert Perry interviewed me in this series. Robert lives in Philadelphia and owns a place called Tattooed Moss. It's like the hippest bar in town. So he was hosting an event for the Young Turks, that awesome independent media uh, institution, really, that Eric uh, was working with. And this was during the DNC, the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia in 2016, already four years ago, amazingly. Oh. And um, we met at this Young Turks event at Tattooed Mobs in Philadelphia. So we kind of recognized each other as Asian American people. I was covering the DNC as a journalist and Eric was there working, of course, with the Young Turks. So we kind of crossed paths and kept in touch and reported about cool events and protests going on. And then Eric happened to be in Chicago um, and was working on um, kind of doing an expose of this really poisoned land in Indiana right uh, close to Chicago and yeah. recruited me as a volunteer. And it was like wild Uber rides and trying to catch people and interview them about all this stuff. So I got a little tiny insight to the kind of world that Eric lives in. So welcome, Eric. Thanks, Mia. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. And Eric is in Australia right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's actually in Australia. So Eric, is there anything else that you want people to know about you? Um, no, I mean, I'm sure we'll cover, we'll cover it, we'll during, our, it. during our talk. Yeah. 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 Oh, and another cool thing about Eric is that Eric and I had, uh, have a lot of friends in common because mm -hmm. Eric in a first life was uh, a filmmaker, independent filmmaker and made a lot of groundbreaking Asian American films. And so a lot of the names and faces that Eric knew, this is kind of like old school as far as Asian American film industry go, I would think, or like maybe second wave or something. Anyway, so um, uh, so we have some friends that come with that. So okay, also an yeah. artist, also an artist in a way. But um, okay, tell us about where you are mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. is going on down there. Okay, um, so this is Canberra. It's the capital of Australia. Uh, we have, there are eight, states in Australia, and the Australian Capital Territory is one of them. Uh, unlike America, the people are allowed to elect um, members to parliament here um, and are fully represented. Um, it's a beautiful little city in the mountains. Uh, it's a wonderful place to raise kids. I have a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son, and we've been in Australia for uh, about uh, 16 months now. And uh, before well, before the bushfires, um, and then uh, immediately following that, the, the pandemic, uh, our life was just perfect. It was the best time in, in my life, in my wife's life, and um, in this, we have we have a lot of family here. My wife is Australian, and the relatives are awesome, so uh, welcoming. And really, the average people that we met were were awesome too, and and they still are. We just haven't seen as much of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I. A lot of people haven't been seeing a lot of everything these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Thanks for that report in your exterior environment. So it's gonna let's turn the lens inside and see what's going on inside of you mm -hmm. in response to the world right now. Well, it's a little bit like, let's say, um, and you're an American and, uh, on September 11th, um, and you weren't on the East Coast. You weren't in D.C. or New York or, or in. Pennsylvania, but you knew those places well. And you know, you're watching the towers burn and completely helpless on the on the West Coast. I was in Los Angeles that day. And so there's just this tremendous sense of loss and um, depression, fear, but not necessarily fear for yourself. Uh, and that's kind of what's happened in Australia 
uh, for Americans here, and um, I have a friend in New Zealand as well. These are two countries very similar, <coughs> you know, having very uh, similar roots to the United States, uh, culturally similar, um, with, without the Civil War though. And I think largely, um, they, both countries responded quite well. So for instance, in Australia, there's been 7,000 and change total cases and 102 total deaths in the entire nation. And uh, in our state, the capital territory, there's been three deaths. Uh, there's uh, been about 106, I think, total cases uh, during the last three months. None are active now. And there hasn't been a new case for three weeks. So it's, you know, it's kind of like floating out in outer space on a space station and watching cities blow up and just, you know, you uh, you feel s definitely safer than than the people who you care about, and then there's a sense of survivor's guilt, um, and just depression. You know, just uh, you know, at this stage of life where I have to worry about my kids, um, and they they don't um, they don't think about it very much, especially not the two year old. Four, four year old has some awareness. Um, it's sometimes easy to kind of drift off into not thinking about it because they're not thinking about it. Um, but they're just kind of hanging over me. There's just this whole, you know, worrying about friends and family and, and, you know, like you, I've traveled all over the, the country. So, you know, you name it where there's an outbreak, I, there's people I'm worried about. Yeah. Wow. You just said a lot of really important things. Uh, it's interesting because you are, in a small, smaller town on an island mm -hmm. on the other side of the planet that has yeah. a very different experience. You know, I'm in Chicago, third yeah. largest city in America. So, of course, yeah. the numbers are high just per capita. Um, but uh, it's interesting that you have a survivor's guilt feeling. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can understand that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a real joy to having the little kids around. It's, it's, oh, yeah, that's, definitely. that's so important. So I hope yeah. that's helping you kind of manage it sounds like it's helping with all this I mean, that's part of the guilt though because in in every way i'm so fortunate you know i could have been frozen in time in another stage of my life where my home life wasn't as idyllic uh you know if it was 10 years ago you know i, I might have <laughs> gone crazy you know but no our, our home life i mean just you know from our house which is in a wonderful beautiful area um kind of a historic uh, center of Canberra that, um, you know, there's so many wonderful things, walking distance and parks and, and places to eat and stuff like that. Um, to the, the city uh, of Canberra, uh, which is kind of an oasis within Australia, because there's been 7,000 some cases, but only 100 of them are here, so not, not nearly our share. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, from the very close to the, to the lar larger distance, um, you know, we you know, just have to count our blessings, really. And but you know, on the flip side of that is the is the guilt. That's wow. That's really insightful. Thanks. Um, I want to pivot a little bit because you are a journalist, and so I, I don't think you can take off those lenses. You know, you're so you're no. a filmmaker, and a, yeah, so you're a filmmaker and you're a journalist. So you are kind of I imagine you would always be observing things from the storytelling and kind of reporting mm -hmm. eyes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, knowing that's a part of your existence, the other part is I'm wondering if you have a, a philosophical or a spiritual response to what's going on. I'll start with the reporter in me. Um, so going back to the bushfires, uh, we had a really scary experience where we were down at the beach, so you could drive two or three hours and get to the east coast of Australia, and there's all these beautiful towns to explore, and we were in one of them when um, there was just a really, really hot day, and um, fires exploded in every direction, so we were trapped. There was the ocean on one side and fires to our south, north, and west, and we just sort of had to wait it out and hope that the fires didn't come much closer. Meanwhile, the, the town just got buried in smoke and um wow. yeah the it I, the reporter in me felt like well i should i should document some of this so i was make i was taking video with my cell phone i was recording audio of uh, some of the locals um 
you know, when I would talk to them. Um, and uh, then I wrote to my, uh, my colleague uh, who I worked with a lot, Ryan Grimm, who's the bureau chief of the, the Washington DC bureau chief of the Intercept. Um, so um, he said, Ed, why don't you write a piece? And so um, even when we were still in danger, I was thinking about what I might write. And then once we <laughs> escaped, you know, the, one, of the, one of the fires was um, controlled. And so we were able to kind of snake out of the, uh, over the mountains and, and uh, back up here. And so I actually wrote two articles for The Intercept. The first one was about being at the beach and uh, having to contemplate jumping in the water as, as people did, you know, not, not far from us to the south, you know, um, an hour, hour's drive or so. I'm not, uh, anyway, uh, clo close to us, there were people who had to don life jackets and jump in the water. Um, and, and, and then we get back to Canberra, which of course it's the capital. We're so close to parliament and, and all the major government buildings. We felt, we felt safe from fire, even though there was one fire that got uh, within four miles. Um, but we felt safe here and it was a similar kind of, you know, just kind of like background radiation of sadness and tragedy, you know, knowing what was happening in the rest of the country. Of course, the scale is completely blown out of the water now when, when, with the current pandemic tragedy. And we had about a month in between. Um, and so we went back to that idyllic life. And, uh, and part of what I wrote about in the second article is the danger of um, creeping back into normalcy when really there's, there's still, um, like for instance now, there's, the virus is still out there and the, and the United States is kind of creeping back toward normalcy. And actually the very first, I did a bunch of Facebook Lives when it looked like the United States and Australia were in a similar boat, I was like, well, let me see what I can do to help it be easier for people to do the shelter in place. And, I'll have these conversations, you know, on, on Facebook. And early on, I talked about the bushfires, and I said there's a danger of, um, you know, this this gravitational pull to believe you're safe and to start um, living life as you had before. And when in a, in the fire situation, what happened was is that we started to feel like we were safe, but then the fires that surrounded us would still bury us with smoke, and then there were dangers from smoke inhalation and especially with the small kids. And so there, there were times when we were out and away from our house and not realizing that danger was coming. And it was in part because we had so wanted to have a normal day that uh, we let our guard down. And um, I, yeah, when I wanted to write something about this experience and I did pitch it to uh, the editor at The Intercept who I worked with for, the, for those pieces, but, um, you know, it's not really necessarily a story here. Um, the government responded effectively and they, they um, adhered to scientific um, advice, medical advice, and the people adhered to the government's requests. And, and so the, 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 the curve was bent down early on, 7,000 total cases. Mm. So. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's so cool that you are a journalist and a reporter, so you have those lenses. Um, so the second part of that question was, I was wondering if you yeah. had like a, if you feel like answering it, you can pass. Sure. I mean, I, I haven't been a religious person. Um, I, um, from an early age, I had a lot of trouble. I was really preoccupied with the reality of suffering in the world. And so when I first came across stories that included death or suffering, um, and then as I got older, I learned about real life events. Um, I would really agonize about it. And I would, be, I, would, I would not be able to get it out of my head, the idea that right now someone in the world is suffering. And my mother, who is the, she is Chinese, um, a little bit more spiritual of the, my two parents. She would talk to me about the, um, she said, everything that lives must die. And she said that suffering and death are part of life. And so if we celebrate and embrace life, then we have to embrace and at least accept that they're suffering. And so I have always been trying to reconcile that and accept that. And I really tried 
um, depending on what stage in my life to to have some impact that lessens that suffering. And you you met me at a time when I was very, you know, that was what I devoted most of my waking hours to, um, uh, exposing injustice so that it might it might be um, addressed. Um, in, when I was younger and making the independent films, that was a little bit more about me, to be honest. You know, that was more about my inner life and what I thought was important, um, that I, what I needed to, to say. And then I went into the documentary films and the journalism and stuff, and that was much more about like throwing my arms around the world and trying to rescue everyone. Um, and then when I, you know, we had the two kids within two years, and so my life really changed. Um, and um, and then it started to become much more focused about the really close in, uh, the making sure that my kids are safe and happy and and healthy and and learning and that sort of thing, remembering to eat that sort of thing, um, or remembering you to feed are them. <laughs> Both well, of you. Yeah, you know, it's funny, it's funny. Like, uh, oh, yeah, recently I said to my wife, oh, you know, I didn't eat breakfast today. I'm feeling kind of weak. And she's like, well, why didn't you eat breakfast? And I said, well, because the kids ate all their breakfast. My normal activities or my, my normal way of, of like sustaining myself is I eat what the kids don't eat. <laughs> and with my son, he's very picky. There's usually, usually there's something for me. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that sort of, you know, that's what I was, that's kind of the world I was in when these two back-to-back uh, -back, uh, crises hit. Mm. And, um, um, you know, I'm dealing. I'm dealing with the awareness of the suffering, an awareness of my helplessness, and there's there was little I could do about the fires. There's very little I can do about uh, what's happening in the United States or around the world mm. with the virus. Um, so it's just you know it's a lifelong thing, and I'm just dealing with it at, at uh, you know larger, larger and larger scales as I get older, and. Um, it just so happens that I'm right now at a stage where there's less that I can do about it because I've, I've decided that my, my most important responsibilities are to my, my kids and my, my wife. That's amazing. You're, that's, you're, you're saying so many really eloquent and authentic things, like tracing the changes. It's great. Hmm. But we have a, a uh, Tommy Henry asked a question. I don't know if you can see to the side. Yeah, of I do see it. Uh -huh. Oh, you say cool. Does Eric have any friends or family in the States that aren't, following CDC guidelines and or believe COVID-19 is overblown here, assuming Tommy's mm. in the States. If yeah. so, what are his thoughts on that? Well, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I do have family in the um, sort of Trump, uh, whatever you want to call it, frame of mind. Um, their, their initial concern was that Trump was going to be blamed and suffer politically for all of this. And then they, when Trump, there was a period of time in, I think, late March when Trump was behaving the way you might expect a president to and saying, there's a public health emergency and we want people to be safe. We we're trying, going to try to keep the death toll lower. And, um, and then I saw there was some, there was some respect for the seriousness of the, of the issue among those, those folks. And then uh, when Trump said, no, you know what, I, I don't care about that. I just want the economy to grow. Um, and any deaths that happen, don't blame me, blame the states or blame China or whatever. Um, that was when you saw the Trump thinking people start to say, all right, well, number one, I don't want him to have any blame and I don't want there to be any political consequences for, for Trump. And then number two, in order to show where my true loyalties are, lie, then I will be against the mask wearing or against the um, social distancing and that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm very disappointed to see that in uh, people I am related to or in people that I made friends with and um, stayed in contact with uh, in my years uh, covering politics. I, I went to dozens of Trump rallies and some of the people I actually, you know, stayed in touch with and, and made friends with. And, um, and and not all of them are still like that. So many of them have changed their mind about Trump in the intervening years. Um, but um, yeah, I'm I, that. 
you know, it's not just like if you're on a space station and you're looking down and you're seeing cities blow up, you're seeing cities being blown up. And, um, and the reasons for it are so stupid and childish uh, and selfish. Uh, so it, yeah, that's really painful. And yeah, that part of the feeling of helplessness and guilt, I guess also is, um, that's part of what's painful about it is that I'm not there to do anything about it. And the truth is, if I really look deep in my heart, I wouldn't want to be there. I feel glad to be here. I have survivor's guilt, but I'd rather have survivor's guilt than be in a country that's being led in this way. Wow, man, truth. It's, it's tough. I have to say, it's, if, if you're a grounded, intelligent human being in America right now, it's tough. <laughs> it's, there's, yep. a lot, there's a lot of uh, emotions and thoughts, and you may have heard about another African-American man being killed by another white cop. I mean, that's just on top of the lack of leadership. I mean, it's just, it's a lot right now. So, yes. hey, man, I think it's great that you, I'm going to say, it's like, it's great you got out. You know what? I'm good for you. I mean, but it also it was it was organic. You know, you left when you your wife had a job. She's Australian. It's not like you knew what was happening here. You know, you you you. I think I understand how and why you might feel guilty, but I'm really happy for you. Like you said, you've got two little kids to take care of. They're a priority for you, and everybody's going to deal with their own challenges in life, no matter where they are and at whatever scale they are. I don't think we can judge levels of suffering. So I'm sure that even there in this lovely family situation you have there, there's still challenges. You know, we, I, I, and by the way, I wouldn't wouldn't dare dare trouble people with my, you know, but yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, the school's closed and uh, daycare was still open, but we chose not to send our kids. And there were, you know, eight weeks of that. We, we did, we did that early, you know, before, before the country of Australia was taking it seriously, we were, and um, we pulled our kids out of school. And yeah, that was a, a bit of a grind, but you know, can't, I cannot compare, you know, just can't complain, the, can't day to, yeah. the day-to-day fear that people are living with in the States. And, you know, of course, I, of course, I know about the um, the latest um, cases in in uh, police brutality, and the things that mystify Australians about the United States um, gun violence and the inability to do anything about that. Uh, all of this uh, government violence against the people, especially people of color. I mean, there's a little bit of that in Australia, but it's not an institution the way it is in the United States. Like all of those mysteries. When I try to explain them, even before COVID-19, when I try to explain them to Australians, you know, I say, you know, you did, you know, we have very similar roots. You do have and did have um, an indigenous people, and there are there's a there's that history, and and Australia is reconciling with that. Uh, They I think they do a much better job, but um, there wasn't a war. And there weren't white Australians taking up arms to defend their aboriginals. And in America, the most deadly event at this stage, other than COVID-19, was the Civil War. And, and in America, they, they have at times been concerned about enemies from without. But I think in, in its soul, America is more concerned about the enemy within, especially white America. And... I think that the roots of these pathologies are the same. Um, that, you know, I remember when the Obamacare website didn't uh, function very well and the, just the huge media row that, especially in Fox News, but all, all the other stations as well. Oh, what a catastrophe, Obama will never recover from this. And now you see a hundred thousand people are dead and the same media pundits and, and some of the same Journalists are saying, well, what are you going to do? 100,000 people here, 100,000 people there. You know, people are dying in other countries too. What are you going to do? It's just amazing. And, and how do you explain that? Like, how do you explain that a, the, a website not functioning was a bigger catastrophe in these people's minds than 100,000 yeah. people suffering and dying yeah. Yeah. and leaving their families behind who, you know, can't even say goodbye to them? Like, how, why does that, <laughs> why is it, why was the website a bigger deal to you? Yeah, and people compare Benghazi as well. You know, four four people dying. 
um, to compared to 100,000? And what's the answer? Why is it, why, you know, the, I see all this beautiful, um, not beautiful, but these brilliant juxtapositions of the police officer kneeling on a man's neck yeah. until he dies and Colin Kaepernick kneeling yes. on the football field. So why, why it's is the, the daily dawn field? on Instagram? Yeah, a lot of people posted that. But what? Why does the football player enrage you? And just why does that preoccupy you? And why does the death of this African American man who called for his mother as he breathed, breathed his last breath? Why is that okay? Why is that part of the cost of doing business? And and I think it all it goes back to the same the same pathologies that when you have a war, when people fight against each other, and there's a potential that, you know, in, in white America during the war, um, people could go either way. Some people went on the other side of the border to fight for the side they believed in. And so there were very powerful ideologies and mythologies, propaganda that were created to try to dehumanize other white people enough to justify taking up arms against your own country and killing people. And even after the war, those mythologies, those uh, th that propaganda continued to first to undo the outcome of the war and re-enslave yeah. African Americans under Jim yeah. Crow laws, take away their rights, um, the, to justify lynching and other acts of terror, and then later to justify the the new Jim Crow that that we have today, and the, those same the same ability to to put aside everything that's in your heart, all your morals. Um, anything you might have learned in any kind of religious teachings to put aside your 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 love for humankind because of what because of what that ability to do that is the same um, that's that's the same disease for want of a better word that Trump is using to call upon people not to wear masks, to go into large gatherings, to gather for a convention, to gather for a church service, um, to, to take weapons into state legislatures and try to intimidate lawmakers. That is actually the very same strain of ignorance and paranoia and hatred of the, the potential enemy within. They're not opposed to government. They're opposed to the idea of multiracial government. They're opposed to the idea of democracy, including people of color. And that's what their fear has been ever since emancipation. And all of the things, you know, like there's sort of an anachronism in, in a way because the, the mythologies were created in order to justify killing, often mass killing. And, and, and yet until very recently, and you might even say today, the people who exploit that mythology would prefer prefer not to have to resort to that, right? Huh. But if you look at some of the recent killers, you know, he was reading that kind of propaganda on the web and he wasn't confused by the anachronism. He just went on and did his thing. And um, the, the people who committed acts of terror in the run up to the 2018 election, three of them, the synagogue, the Kroger grocery store, and uh, the pipe bomber, they were imbibing that same propaganda that the real enemy is um, not just the caravan, right? But also the, the Jewish rabbi who believe in the caravan and might wanna help um, people uh, um, who are asylum seekers uh, to survive here. Um, not just you know the African-American guy on the street who we need to make a, a, a uh, example of by murdering, but also um, the the white uh, soccer mom who might object to that. Uh, so the if I could, you know, have a dialogue with some of these people and ask them, because I interviewed a lot of people who were upset about the even existence of Black Lives Matter. My question would be, whatever it is you think you gain when power is expressed in that way when a person loses their life at the hands of their government because, um, because they can get away with it, but, but just because we're in the habit and we've always been in the habit of expressing power in that way, using the human body to express power. 
whatever it is you think you gain, the little advantage you think you gain that you might pass on to your kids with, with right, white privilege or at the voting booth or, or whatever, or maybe it, th it makes you feel a little safer, you know, as that lady in Central Park showed, you know, in an instant. Not that she did, not that she felt threatened, but that she wanted to make a threat. I'll call the police and tell them that you're an African American man. And but, you're trying to kill me. <laughs> yeah. Threatening. Yeah. Yeah. She and did my say dog. kill at one point. Yeah. She did, did say she yeah. really? Oh, my. I think. I think. She definitely said threaten a lot. But anyway. But whatever it is you think you're gaining from from that injustice or any injustice, voting voter suppression, um, you know, the, the environmental racism that I was reporting on when we met, whatever it is you think you're gaining from that, like what ask yourself what also what you're losing in your own humanity and your own soul and and start to weigh that because yeah the the it's not it, there the there are there's certainly a history of conflict within the United States and you know you've seen people who have when i i've met people who welcome the Russian intervention in, in our elections because they believed it would help the South rise again. It would help racism, you know, it would help re, re like reestablish white supremacy. Um, but look at what you're, look at what you're giving up. When you, when you say I, you're giving up the sovereignty of this nation and you're giving up on most of the ideals, basically, all of the ideals except for white supremacy on which this country was founded. And I just wonder if maybe the one bright side of the epidemic as it starts to spread into um, Trump country and people have to live with that fear for who knows how long that they'll start to question, wow, there are things that I gain by being angry on command, by telling myself that a website not malfunctioning is more important than 100,000 deaths that tell, telling myself that a football player kneeling is more offensive to me than a person being murdered by their government. Whatever it is you're gaining, you're losing too. And maybe people are gonna start weighing those two things and realize they're losing more. Oh, that's a great thought. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope for that. Well, we're, we're, we're past time and I know this is so interesting though. I, I think you should do, you should have one of these series yourself. I know we emailed about that. No, I told so you if I had the time, I'd do exactly what you're doing. <laughs> Well, that's because we're thinking alike. Yeah. Um, because there's, you know, again, there's people who have, like you, who I'm lucky enough to know, that have these interesting observations of what's going on in the world, COVID or not. And I think it's important that these observations are out there. And I hope that everybody, we can start to cross-pollinate and also get inspired by, by authentic voices like yours. So thank you so much, Eric. You said a lot of stuff, you know. I, when you have one of these, I'll tune in because you should have one of these. <laughs> When, I'll, and, I'll see what uh, I can do. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And thanks for your comments, Tommy. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, thanks, make sure yeah. to like my yay, like my Facebook page, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got more of these interviews coming in through June. So take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.